Welcome back, everyone. Most of the large NPL portfolios uh, have traded. So over the last few years, we've seen the kinds of the, the sorts of amoebas, the Jupiters, and so on, the frontiers. Going forward, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more securitizations. And as a matter of fact, uh, Greece is expect, expected to overtake Italy when it comes to securitizations. So it's a, matter, it's, it's a topic of huge importance. So the next panel is going to examine the trends, the challenges, the issues, uh, progresses, um, investor demands, and so on. Uh, we have with us uh, the head of the panel, Annalisa Dentonilita, who is going to moderate. The floor is yours. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, so our panel will be dealing about securitization, um, progresses and challenges. So we will be discussing with our panelists uh, um, a few issues uh, um, in terms of uh, issues that have been coming out over the years uh, in the securitization NPL markets and, and then going to see some trends um, going ahead and challenges. So I, I will let my panel, the, the panelists introduce themselves so we can start with Dimitri. Hello. Uh, thank you, Annalisa. Thank you to the organizers as well. So uh, I would like uh, uh, to point out some issues which uh, are of importance uh, for this whole market. First, and uh, uh, I am uh, uh, a lawyer. I am a lawyer uh, working in Greece uh, since uh, 88 mm -hmm. <laughs> in the capital markets and in the banking and finance. And uh, we had uh, the opportunity to handle securitization cases already um, in 2005, 2006, as a member of a group of the European Central Bank, which prepared at this phase uh, a report on cross-border securitizations. Actually, our main experience is uh, providing legal assessment to the Greek credit rating agency, ICAP, regarding securitizations. And from this point of view, it's exactly what I uh, started saying, how important is transparency in all these issues for securitization. Okay, thank you, Dimitri. And we will uh, let Ilias and Erin introduce themselves, and then we can start our discussion. Good morning, everybody, and congratulations again to the DDC for taking the effort to bring us together back on a live event after uh, almost two years. Um, I'm Ilias, and I'm a CEO in UBO of an integrated operational platform called Hellenic Investments Recovery Advisors representing a full-service uh, advisory, NPL servicing and real partner to um, fund managers, and mainly active through two operating companies in, G in Greece, one called Aegis, for which uh, hat I'm wearing today to discuss about securitization, and a second one is called EU Praxis, which is an NPL servicer in Greece. Thank you. Thank you. Elias and Irene, please. Yeah, thank, uh, good morning to everyone, and uh, thank you to the organizers and Annalisa for moderating the panel. Um, from my side, my name is Irene Canoni. I work for European Data Warehouse. Um, I'm in business development and regulatory affairs. I monitor closely the regulatory developments uh, in the areas of securitization, uh, non-performing loans, and sustainable finance. And um, the past years, I've been heavily involved in the development of the securitization repository platform uh, based on the various uh, technical standards that were published Thank under you. the regulation. And, uh, and I'm, a, I'm Annalisa Dintoni, and I'm a partner at Auric, based in Italy. So um, just as a brief introduction to, to our panel, we, um, we're going to be talking about securitization. Securitizations, uh, and, more in, and more specifically, MPL securitizations um, have been increasingly becoming a tool, the most probably effective tool for dismissing um, banks' portfolios uh, over the years. So we've seen this in Italy, and as, as Tassos mentioned, and, in, uh, um, and we're seeing more and more in Greece. Just a couple of points to start our, our discussion. 
uh, certainly the introduction of uh, state guarantee has increased the use of securitizations uh, for MPLs. More and more we're seeing transactions. We've seen this in Italy where GAX was implemented in 2016, extended for a couple of times and extended again until June 2022. And in Greece, where HAPS or the Hercules scheme was introduced in uh, 2019 and extended now until October 2022. So definitely uh, we will be saying, just uh, discussing about uh, the, 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 the impact uh, maybe of uh, um, an angle on HAPS uh, transaction um, on, uh, on MPL securitization. Second point is increased focus of the EU regulator on securitization and MPL securitization in particular. So we've seen the, the recovery package with the measures that have already been introduced in 2020, um, modifying securitization regulations to um, enhance the possibility of doing MPL securitization, so more customized for MPLs. So just as an example, the servicer can, um, can now do the retention uh, piece of the securitization and, uh, um, and they've changed the, the, the way the retention piece is calculated, which is much more now appropriate for MPL securitization. Um, so I would, uh, um, I would leave now, and then we will be speaking about regulatory um, issues uh, with, with our panelists. So I would, I would start our discussion because we just mentioned HAPS uh, with Ilias. Um, we understand that you have been acting as a monitoring, independent monetary trustee for HAPS. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience, the HAPS that you've been seeing, reviewing, yes. and challenges that you've encountered? Yes, um, Aegis is independent monitoring trustee for the European Commission, both for Hercules I and Hercules II, which is more than 60 billion altogether uh, transactions. And pretty much the main task is to um, guarantee that the guarantee issuance process is being implemented and that all the obligations of the involved stakeholders and authorities are fulfilled. Uh, as of today, we have a total application for Hercules One, um, almost um, 12 billion. It's actually 11.8, taking into account uh, that anticipating the positive approval of uh, the frontier Julia, transaction. Your, your microphone, maybe just put it closer. Okay. One, two. One, two. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, Hercules II is expected uh, an additional volume of um, around, say, 30, 32 billion of additional applications. As of today, official applications have been filed by two banks, and a total of um, number three, uh, around 5 billion. And that's um, Eurobank and uh, Piraeus. It's uh, public. Um, Sunrise uh, 2 and 3 from Piraeus and uh, Mexico from, uh, from Eurobank. Now, um, it's common that um, within these transactions, the NPL securitizations, they usually, of course, they the creation of uh, Ryokos, which could from time to time acquire properties, which were also mentioned yesterday in several panels. Um, and within this framework, the seller needs to understand that they have subscribed a loan facility agreement with the Ryokos. Uh, the loans needs to be serviced uh, by the NPL servicer, while the uh, RIOs need to be serviced by different uh, entity. As far as KPIs uh, are concerned, which is a um, hot topic and always receive questions, uh, the major KPIs that um, we report back to the Commission actually are the cumulative uh, gross collection and the cumulative net uh, collections. However, a very tricky point with um, legal aspects, and I'm sure you have uh, seen it as you are indeed very active in securitizations as uh, ORIC, um, very much also in Italy and Greece, is that um, we have the, um, the following point here in Greece. If the loss exceeds um, the profit for the year, the relevant uh, provision of the so-called Hardovelis law should be activated, uh, which imposes actually a trade-off of the final and clear uh, tax receivables through a share capital increase in favor of the Greek state. Now, to avoid this, the banks are undergoing transformations in which a holding company carries out uh, the securitization by selling to a private investor 
uh, part of the mezzanine junior notes, as required by uh, law 4649, recording the loss from uh, the difference between the net book value and the actual valuation. Now, in addition, uh, it holds the senior notes and uh, proceeds uh, with equal lending uh, to the 100% subsidiary bank. In this way, the activation of uh, the aforementioned law, the Hardovelis law, is avoided, as the loss is registered by the holding company, while the deferred tax claims are borne by 100% subsidiary banks. Now, in all cases, we need to have special uh, care and is required as uh, the Greek law uh, stipulates that uh, the Greek state, legal entities under public law or any entity under the general government, including companies directly or indirectly uh, controlled by the state, which are actually uh, shareholders um, uh, in the banks, uh, cannot acquire uh, mezzanine or junior notes uh, in the context of securitization uh, of the claims for which an application has been uh, submitted. Final quick point, uh, which is very interesting, are the penalties. So after the 24 months that we have the grace period, if any um, interest payment date, the cumulative actual collections are at least 20% um, lower than the initial target according to the business plan that has been rated by the credit rating uh, agency, uh, then we have uh, a penalty in this referral. In addition to this, uh, there is um, also postponement um, of um, performance breach uh, on the servicing fees. And worst case scenario, there is uh, mentioned that at some point the change of servicer could also be uh, applied. So I tried to cover some uh, interesting points and yeah. back to you, Annalise, and more than happy to take any is, questions uh, later on. This is very interesting, and I'm just going to point out that, uh, uh, thank you, Elias, that, uh, for example, one difference between GACs and HAPS uh, law, which are very similar for many, many uh, aspects, is that in Greece uh, uh, there is a grace period for this breach. When we start calculating collection for purposes of the breach in Italy, there is no grace period, for example. So just to point out this difference. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I would go to uh, Dimitris now on the regulatory side of securitization and PLs. So if you can tell us a little bit, we mentioned the recovery package that has already been passed, but there is a, a proposal directive now on secondary distribution, which is also a very important aspect of this um, market. If you can tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Annalisa. So we should not forget that in Greece we have already since 2003 a law regarding securitization, enabling securitizations and covering a lot of issues. Uh, we have also uh, for, since uh, 2017 the securities <coughs> regulation at the European level as amended last year especially. Uh, however, the issue of the credit services is a very important issue in whole Europe. We have uh, in Greece the law uh, of 2015, 4354, uh, as amended many, many times. And in Europe, the issue you raised, um, Annalisa, is that limited participation of non banks in the NPL markets in many European countries led to low demand, weak competition, and low bid prices when marketing NPLs in the initial phase already. All that, of course, these, in, uh, uh, these uh, in, incentives uh, banks to sell NPLs at a low price despite the supervisor's pressure the European Commission reacted uh, through an attempt to widen the investor basis for EU securitizations by proposing a new directive aiming at the development of a competitive and integrated market in the European Union for credit purchases and credit services through their regulation. So, the proposal directive of March 2018, which is in its final phase um, for its adoption, aims at stimulating demand for NPLs by generating a larger investor basis through 
lowering entry barriers and thus enhancing competition among investors. We should say that Greek law is very similar to the main principles of this proposal directive. Uh, facilitating the expansion of loan services across borders would allow to top scale economies, compete for cross-border business and provide services at low prices to non-bank NPL investors. What is, however, additionally needed for the creation of a well-functioning secondary market for NPLs in the European Union? Secondary market, we know that very well, means that the initial investor will be able to sell the securitization product, to resell, etc., etc. So a certain liquidity, you mentioned that, Annalisa, in the secondary market is therefore a prerequisite. It is well known that investors, when investing in a secondary market, require conditions allowing the formation of a fair price. And a secondary market, in order to be able to offer fair price, requires transparency. So that is the issue which has been subject of the discussion in the previous panel as well. How can we get to this transparency? Which information are necessary? How can this information be accessible? And how can be the case regarding private securitization? The ability of investors and potential investors to exercise due diligence and thus making an informed assessment of the credit worthiness of a given securitization instrument and thus of the quality of the assets depends on their access to information on those instruments. So we have transparency twofold. First, in the primary market when issuing the products and then for the secondary market as a continuous obligation, as a prerequisite for this reselling I previously mentioned. Transparency in the primary market in case of public securitization is self-evident. We have the regulation prospectus, uh, uh, the, the prospectus regulation, uh, and it uh, does not create any problem. However, Transparency in the secondary market, especially regarding private securitization, where the bonds are not admitted to a regulated market or to an MTF, that is the issue. It's a more complicated issue. Uh, creating a comprehensive system under which investors and potential investors will have access to all the relevant information of the entire life of the transaction is quite complicated. The establishment of a framework for securitization repositories through the, securities, uh, the, uh, the uh, securitization regulation uh, to collect relevant reports primarily on underlying exposures in securitizations aims, of course, at enhancing market transparency. Providing the investors with a single and supervised source of the data necessary, be careful, single and supervised source on the data necessary for performing their due diligence will reduce, of course, uncertainty and counterpart risk, so may create appetite for investors. And if further that will reduce originators, sponsors, and SPVs reporting tasks and facilitate investors continuous easy and free access to reliable information on securitizations, this will reduce transaction costs. And that is a prerequisite for a well-functioning market and for the confidence of the investors yeah. to securitizations. Thank you. Dimitri, and 
absolutely, we all agree on the fact that uh, um, transparency and providing information in an MPL sector increases, uh, um, you know, the number of transactions that can be done in the secondary market and improves the secondary market. So, um, regarding information and disclosure of, um, of data, we have here Irene, who is, I think, in a good position to tell us a little bit of that, about the challenges of that. And then, Irene, before that, if you want to comment on the regulatory um, uh, side, so on the consultation of the EU to which you yeah. participated, with, it would be great. Yeah, I think one point that we didn't touch is the actual upcoming review of the securitization regulation, Yes, which is due um, in the beginning of next year. And uh, over the summer period, there was this uh, European Commission's consultation um, on this upcoming review. And as a securitization repository, of course, we uh, responded to this consultation. <coughs> our, our response focused on like uh, three main areas, the private securitizations, the uh, due diligence, investors' due diligence, and the sustainability disclosures. Now, on the private securitizations part, I think that we actually, in our view, um, the actual definition of what constitutes private versus public securitizations is uh, a very important it's key, actually, for the future development and the um, well-functioning of the securitization market. So um, in that sense, also, I have to say that we do differentiate, we think that we should differentiate, at least, between private bilateral securitizations, such as warehousing transactions, and uh, securitizations with listings on um, exchange markets like uh, the GEM and the Irish Stock Exchange. And um, the, in the private discussion, actually, most of our, uh, most of the Greek NPL transactions, securitizations, are, um, we understand they're currently falling in the scope of the private securitizations as defined in the regulation. And um, that the transparency requirements now for private, we do believe that it could be, take a diff actually could take a different format. And what I mean by different format is that uh, take into consideration these privacy aspects and probably um, share the information only with the national competent authorities and um, the relevant investors, but not this public disclosure that all public securitizations have to, um, to go through. Uh, and this is also our view as a securitization repository, which is our role in the market, as Dimitri says, is to enhance the market transparency. But we still believe that there should be some differentiation in this uh, private public disclosure. Now, moving on the investors' due diligence part, I think um, what actually is more relevant is the actual discussion on the usefulness of the loan-by-loan -loan information. And um, looking at this particular part, at the, like the usefulness for us, uh, for the most prominent asset classes, RMBS, um, SMEs, uh, corporate loans, and um, auto ABS, for example, the, we do believe that the loan-by-loan -loan information is quite useful. Uh, whereas for trade receivables, probably less relevant in that sense. Uh, but uh, COVID-19 actually was one of the um, um, topics that uh, we managed, actually was an opportunity for us to demonstrate the value in the data. Because since uh, March 2020, we have been monitoring the performance of the actual um, uh, securitized loans that we have in our platform. And we have identified um, kind of like potential borrowers, or at least type of borrowers, that uh, could have uh, been impacted and will be impacted at the end of these moratorium payment schemes. And um, finally, on the sustainability disclosures, um, which I think is a quite a relevant topic in general and a high priority in the European Commission's agenda, uh, we uh, believe that kind of, uh, EBA, we understand, already works on and conducts some work on sustainability disclosures and a potential framework for sustainable securitization. In this context, um, we think that it, we need a clear and standardized definition of sustainable securitization and um, also some alignment uh, with any existing regulatory reporting and sustainability disclosures under other regulations. So 
in order to promote this safe and sound development of this sustainable securitization market. Definitely, sustainability is across the board a, a disappointed target of the, all the EU regulation, and, and it, will, it is going to, in a way, affect securitizations as well. Mm -hmm. um, you all mentioned data at this point. You all mentioned transparency. You all mentioned disclosure in one way or another. Um, it is also uh, our experience in, uh, in structure, in transaction, that data are the most important, uh, let's say, information available about, about the portfolio. The more sophisticated it is, uh, the easier it is to, you know, um, uh, have investors come and, and, uh, and, um, and purchase these portfolios and also um, then report uh, to, the, to the regulator and monitor the, how, how then the securitizations are going. Um, Ilias, uh, do you have, uh, do you want to add something to the regulatory discussion based on your point of view, both and service experience and uh, uh, independent trustee? Uh, um, I would like to touch base on some points in, uh, in, in regards to your introductory comments, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, I would also agree and say that um, the new EU STS framework is definitely towards uh, the right uh, direction and we needed it as, uh, as a market tool. Uh, but we have to keep in mind in general that uh, while synthetic securitizations and uh, uh, traditional securitizations are not fundamentally, do not fundamentally differ in terms of underlying exposures, um, risk transferring or waterfall, there is a major uh, difference in the ways of risk transferring. Um, you know it much, much better because you've been involved in several, and in many, I would say, uh, transactions. I mean, traditional securitizations realizes uh, the transfer by transferring the, um, the actual underlying exposure and ownership to a separate uh, SP, uh, special purpose entity, um, whereas, the, um, uh, whereas the synthetic securitization realizes uh, the same effect through a credit protection uh, yes. scheme. Uh, now, having said that, um, uh, the risk retention, as you were also mentioning, uh, risk retention and PE securitizations, I would say that they need to be addressed under a special uh, uh, regime when it comes to fulfilling the risk retention uh, slide. I mean, in order to, make, to, in order to better take into account uh, the, the various special characteristics. Um, and, and in this respect, it's very important that the servicer, uh, as you were saying as well, uh, is allowed to take part of the risk retention slide in order to align the interests in, in a direct way with, with the investor, which is pretty much us going back and have a view now on the potential business plans, um, the, uh, the actual versus the, the target. In a way, bottom line, this uh, GACs or the HAPS scheme should be in favor of the taxpayer, meaning that in the end, the Greek state, let's keep it here as we're in Greece, should not be paying uh, the 12 billion for Hercules I and additionally um, the, the 12 or 15 billion for Hercules II. So therefore it's very important that the services themselves are aligned going forward in the future with, with the interests of investors. Final quick point, in general as um, uh, regulators and, uh, and laws, uh, re regardless of the overall complexity of the securitization structures, there shouldn't be um, there shouldn't be a way for the originators or the sellers to um, to provide indirect incentives to choose synthetic or traditional securitizations. This is, I would say, a, a comment. Well, I mean, we have two lawyers here in the in the panel, yeah. but I find it very interesting going forward keeping in mind what I said: the taxpayers' uh, money, especially in Greece, because we have a large deficit and a yeah, you, large bulk of... You um, are absolutely right. I mean, at the end of the day... Uh, the, uh, thank you, Elias. And at the end of the day, the, um, the goal, uh, I would say, ultimate goal in the mind of everybody when they structure HAPS and GACs uh, transactions is really not to execute, not to enforce the guarantee, that the guarantee should not be enforced, hopefully. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, the, the business plan that you mentioned is crucial. So really, the more the, service, the, more the business plan is accurate, 
given the, you know, the situation, the better for the securitization, also because we need to remember that the, then the parameters um, and the GACs uh, perhaps work based on the initial business plan. So once the business plan is done and the rating agencies have evaluated that business plan, um, it's now going to be very easy. I mean, of course, it's been updated every year, but the yeah, evaluations are going to be on the initial business plan. So it's uh, um, becoming more and more important to, um, to, to, to let's say, to, to, the, this business plan is done in the most efficient and accurate way. And that's why we go back to uh, data again, because the more we see, we've seen it over the years, the more banks are, are getting better and knowing their data and collecting their data and presenting them in a, let's say, cluster way or more accurate way to the rating agencies and, to, and in the business plan and to the servicer, then the better the transaction will, uh, um, will do over, over the years. Uh, we've seen this with COVID. With COVID, it's hard to, you know, this is not legal, um, let's say comment, but we've seen that the, it's harder to measure how the transaction is doing because you will, with COVID, because you need to understand what is, you know, if uh, the impact is given by COVID or if the impact is given by, you know, the general economy or the business plan. So it's uh, definitely, it's a little harder, but we will see going forward, uh, hopefully. Um, one question for, you know, uh, for, all, for all of you, um, I just mentioned COVID. Do you think um, we, some commentator, someone says that uh, once the measures, uh, the COVID help measures uh, expire or the effect, uh, the beneficial effects of the measures stops, uh, we're going to see more and more MPLs coming to the market. This is, uh, you know, the, the general understanding. Do you agree? Do you have comments on, uh, on this from your specific, let's say, point of view of each of you? Uh, just one point to add here. Yes, I think there is an anticipation of this kind of like non-performing loans um, due to COVID and after at the end of this moratorium and payment schemes. Uh, but I think that already the European Commission is taking action and they have already published this European Commission action plan to tackle the non-performing loans uh, in the aftermath of COVID. So we've seen that already there is some attention and the regulators and the policymakers are looking into this and taking some action before the wave of NPLs. The wave uh, comes in before the wave comes. Potential wave, sorry. Potential, potential. <laughs> what, what do you think, Elias? Um in addition to this uh, moratorium and employment schemes we have in Greece, we have to take into consideration that we had an additional uh, weapon from the central bank, which is liquidity. Yes. So when all this will be withdrawn, personal view is that uh, there will be an increase uh, in NPLs, whether it's going to be two, five, ten billion. It's it's another story. I'm not. I cannot predict, but I see that we'll have, unfortunately, a a, a, a reverse trend that we had pre-COVID. So we, we are doing so many efforts in Greece and we might see again an increase, which is not a good sign going into 2022. And in our case, in addition to the private debt, we have the public debt. Anyway, it's, it's a more complex story in, uh, in Greece. And Italy, So it I guess. might <laughs> seem logical that, uh, but, on, but on the other hand, <laughs> therefore we, we need to um, try as a country to go back into growth yeah. sooner than later. Yeah, exactly. Also, because as we know, because many transactions, uh, uh, I mean, MPL is very much tied to the, to the actual economy and, the, and the ongoing, you know, how the economy is going and the real estate value. You know, if the economy improves, then it's going to be easier to, to maximize the value. What about you, you think, Dimitri? Yeah. Uh we know very well that the European Central Bank started the open market operations in another environment during the financial crisis and the euro crisis, especially with Italy and Spain. They did that already for Greece, but then with the Draghi bazooka, it was in 2012, etc. And we know very well the reaction from Germany, especially. First, it was Pringle. We have 
the European Court decision, then Gauweiler, and finally the famous Weiss decision of the European Court of Justice and the spectacular decision of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, of the European Constitutional Court. So this issue regarding open market operations, which may tackle uh, the PEEP the PEP program, <laughs> uh, the consequences of the pandemic uh, of COVID, etc., in the economy, are a weapon. But we should <coughs> differentiate between uh, liquidity issues and capital adequacy issues of a bank. Mm. If uh, we have just liquidity issues, Never mind. <laughs> uh, but we should not forget that even at the initial phase of the financial crisis internationally, we thought, and we, uh, when I say we, I don't mean Greece, I mean even the European Central Bank, that the main issues, 2008, 2009, they thought that they were liquidity issues. It was not the case. Then we had the sovereign debt crisis, and they recognized that all these issues were capital adequacy issues of the banks, and that is the point. So uh, the issue now is, uh, and we, I as a lawyer don't want to take a position on that, if uh, pandemia will really influence credit institutions in their liquidity, if pandemia will uh, harm the debtors of the banks and then aggravating the repayment of the loans, that it will have some impact. Of course it will have. How big, how important will be this impact? We don't know. I must tell you, however, that regarding Greece, since Greece had already a lot of NPLs and has a lot of NPLs, the banks, I mean the credit institutions, have a lot of NPLs and has this experience, we have seen the worst scenario. <laughs> I don't believe that pandemia itself mm. will be the main issue, the main problem. Of course, aggravating a little bit the situation, the problem, yeah, but not, it will, does, it does not uh, harm the core of the banking system, I think. Yeah. I, I, I agree, and it goes back to your comment and to what Ilios was saying, that uh, it is uh, even more than pan pandemic effects, is the economy that needs to grow. And in particular, I would say um, the SME's, uh, you know, system would probably be need, needed to be um, improved and helped very much. And I'm speaking for Greece and I'm speaking for Italy because they're the countries where the most SMEs are. Um, and, and, and this, is, uh, this is great. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Ilias, before a, comp a comment about synthetic and uh, um, and non-synthetic securitization. It is true, synthetic securitization being, let's say, more and more used. Um, and uh, uh, it goes to your comment, Dimitri, on the, on the uh, capital uh, requirements for banks and the prudential requirements. So they help a lot with the capital requirements issues. We haven't seen them for MPLs yet. Uh, we are seeing them for, uh, but we are seeing them now, starting to see them. Of course, uh, first we see them in Italy, then, you know, sometimes we see after a year or two in Greece, uh, for these um, this kind of claims that are called stage two. So they are still performing, but they are almost going to become MPL. So the banks are starting to cover those uh, with synthetic securitization so that, you know, in a way they are protected already. Um, uh, I guess uh, um, we have 10 more minutes, so I guess, and then I would leave it to questions if there are. Um, maybe I will ask each of you to, to give, him, give me a comment, give us a comment on uh, what you see going forward in the securitization market for MPL in particular, so um, let's say challenges and trends. So I will start with Irene okay. this time, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you want. Thanks, sure. 
Um, I think as a background information, the um, European Data Warehouse is, since June 2021 is um, an ESMA securitization, registered securitization repository under the regulation. And while the regulation entered into force in 2019, um, I mean, started to apply from 2019, there were some uh, delays in the secondary legislation with the ESMA templates uh, being finalized and published uh, in September last year. And um, I said secure, the first securitization repository being approved in, um, in June this year. So um, the main challenges, of course, are related to reporting requirements and reporting to securitization repositories. Now, um, I think it would be much easier and useful if I could explain the securitization repository um, reporting, uh, but I think it, we don't have enough time, <laughs> so I'll try to just uh, keep the conclusions of actually what are the key challenges. Um, of course, data availability is an important um, one, and I think it's also related to the fact that for NPL securitizations, they have to report, of course, the underlying exposures in the ESMA templates, but they also have an add-on template, which is based on the European Banking Authority NPL transaction data template, and it's, um, it's quite a lot of information in that sense, so detailed information for NPS. So yeah. we, we see that one of the challenges is indeed uh, data availability. Uh, data quality is another main uh, big area where we do see uh, quite a few challenges. Um, in the securitization repository regime, uh, there are some uh, prescribed validation rules that if the bank from ESMA, that if the bank and the originator cannot actually um, meet the requirements, then the, um, there is no successful submission of data to the repository. And um, there, but of course, like we do help the, and assist the market with several tools that we have to actually identify where the problems are and be able to actually correct it uh, before they upload the data to their securitization repository. And um, I think that was one technical challenge, I would say that the format required is the extensible markup language to fill in these templates. And this is uh, generally a more complex format, um, but it's quite common in other regulatory reporting. So, but we still believe that this is a kind of like um, a point which still some small banks have problems of actually uh, um, preparing the data in this format. And there are of course technical solutions there. Um, so we, we do help them also on this, uh, on this part. Now, um, potential future challenges, I would say. Um, there is this, uh, as part of the European Commission's action plan to tackle the NPLs in the aftermath of COVID, there is um, the revision of the European Banking Authority templates, um, uh, the NPL data templates there, which uh, of course is the templates where the ESMA uh, NPL add-on template is based on. So we don't know if these templates change, if there will be any change in the, in the templates for, um, in the ESMA templates in that sense. And um, yeah, I think also another point probably can be ta data timeliness. So there are some strict requirements that you need to meet as a like reporting entity. You need to actually um, have uh, the data quite fresh, not with an older data cutoff than two months prior to the submission. So, there are some strict requirements with the new securitization repository regime that has um, some challenges for the reporting entities. And yeah. Banks. No, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Yeah. Uh, Ilias? Um, I would wrap it up in the following points. Uh, in, in general, the concentration uh, in any market, personal view, is that it's not towards the right direction. In, in this respect, I mean that, uh, and therefore the risk retention slide and alignment of interest between investors and servicers needs to come into place sooner rather than later because imagine in, a, in our market it seems that we have a concentrated market like 90 percent is being covered by two three maximum four names imagine one is not performing that will be a nightmare for the market and the economy at some point so therefore indirectly now also the buy side is asking for more transactions smaller or medium transactions that they can enter uh, the market. Um, so, so that might be an interesting point at some point to consider, both through securitizations, but in addition, when we speak about NPLs, NPLs uh, through sale, um, through the originators, or maybe on the secondary market. Because in the end, 
we do have this grace period, but imagine what will be happening after one year, which is kick the can in a way, for, for the next 12 or 24 months. We might have a different government or not, but the problem for all the stakeholders will still be here. So the issue will be how to tackle at some point finally the problem and not just kick the can um, for 12, 40, 24 or 30 months. True, true. Thank you. Ilias and Dimitri. Yes, Annalisa. Uh, we know very well that the Greek legal framework recognizes only private securitizations, only private placement is possible. That is important from the point of view of the transparency requirements we have discussed and which were the subject of the previous panel. So, uh, private securitizations are exempted um, from the security, securitization regulation from the requirement to disclose detailed information about the transaction through a securitization repository. However, Besides that, private securitizations are in principle subject to, let's say, the same transparency requirements as public securitizations uh, in accordance with Article 7 of the Securitization Regulation through the website. So, uh, the legal framework uh, acknowledges the bilateral and bespoke nature of private securitizations. They are important because they allow parties to enter into securitization transactions without disclosing sensitive commercial information of the transaction. For example, disclosing that a certain company needs funding to expand production or that an investment firm is entering a new market as part of its strategy. <coughs> Private securitizations don't need to disclose information, to originators, etc., related to the underlying assets, to the market, and competitors uh, on the type of trade uh, receivable generated by an industrial firm, etc. In those cases, initial investors will be in direct contact with the originator and the sponsor and receive the information necessary to perform their due diligence directly from them. However, how easy is that and how big transaction costs are produced if this direct contact is possible? And in the secondary market, uh, how would it, could it be guaranteed in the secondary market? Let's say in the initial market when uh, initial public offering uh, is made, okay, we can have this direct contact. In the second phase, at the second phase, who will be willing then to buy such a product, the bonds, if no information and ongoing information is yes. available? Because information uh, one year ago are not more accurate. So, should private securitizations continue to be exempted from the requirement to notify the transaction information to securitization repository or not? And to what extent? So waiting and finding a balance in order not to create overregulation, but on the other side, enhancing secondary markets prerequisites for transparency is a desideratum which is very important and the discussion at the, in the European Commission uh, which started and the proposal we are um, very, uh, very curious to see how this will be developed. Thank you, Dimitri. Yeah. Irene, did you want to do yes. one, last, well, one more minute? So <laughs> yes, <please>. sir. <laughs> I just want to add, uh, because Dimitri said on a very good point, on the fact that indeed in the actual securitization regulation, it says that private securitizations are indeed exempted from reporting to securitization repositories. But what we understand is like, while there are technical standards that define the operational manner of how to make available the um, information, the data specifically, uh, for public securitizations, in the actual, um, there's no prescribed manner of how to make uh, the information available, which you have as a requirement okay. under the regulation, 
uh, for private securitization. And therefore, I have to say that we already kind of like um, provide this uh, solution, reporting solutions, and reporting entities are, do actually come to us and are seeking those uh, reporting solutions uh, because they actually, apart from um, facilitating the reporting, the regulatory reporting process, they also want to um, meet this data quality um, Standard. high standards that we um, we can offer as a securitization poster in meeting the requirements for public securitization. So there, I have to say that indeed they are exempted, but we do have a lot with the report in the private area. And of course, it's a controlled transmission of data to the relevant national common authorities and the, um, the private investors. Yeah. But it's not accessible to everyone. So. And the need to report to the supervisor. Yes. Which is uh, given cannot be exempted, of course, is provided for in the securitization regulation. How all that can be combined and how a balance between uh, sufficient and proportionate information with not overlasting the stakeholders. It's not an easy issue. No, but thank you very much. We're, our time is up, I, <laughs> Martin. And uh, thank you to our panelists. Thank you, everyone, for, for the attention. Thank you, Martin.